Good morning, and welcome to our second lesson on the Torah, the structure, authenticity, development, and relevance of Torah. Today I'd like to talk about the structure. As you've heard so many times in previous classes, Judaism believes that when God revealed himself at Mount Sinai to all of the Jewish people, and subsequently when Moses came on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, and what did he do in the 40 days and 40 nights? He wasn't going to watch reruns. <laughs> he was being taught Torah by God, a pretty good teacher and pretty good student. And what he taught him was a system that consisted of two parts. A written part, part which he was told, put into writing, word by word, letter by letter. The five books of Moses that are contained in the Torah scroll has 304,805 letters. And if you don't believe me, start counting. When you get to the end, and if it's different than what I just said, I'll have to correct myself. But we have over 300,000 letters. Every letter is precise. So that was the written Torah. That's in Hebrew, it's called Torah Shebiktav, the Torah that is put into writing. And that includes all of biblical literature. Now, of course, when we say biblical, we mean what Judaism considers biblical, not what other religions consider biblical. And that's why we don't use the term Old Testament, because there is no New Testament. Judaism's teachings that were given at Mount Sinai are eternal. There is no revision or reversal of what God had in mind when he gave us the Torah. So there was a written Torah, a written text, and there was also an oral Torah, an a oral text that Moses was told by God, and we'll go into it, what exactly does the oral Torah comprise, and that was what he was responsible for transmitting to the people. So he would teach people the written text, and then he would also give them the oral tradition, the oral teachings. So let's go through the written text. The written text, as I said, was put into writing by Moses. That's why they're called the five books of Moses. It's not his words, those are God's words, but God transmitted, transmitted them through the prophet called Moses, who was considered to be the greatest prophet that ever lived. Nobody superseded Moses in prophecy. Even the Mashiach, Maimonides says, will be close to Moses in prophecy, but not exactly the same. And the reason why Moses' prophecy was qualitatively different from any other prophet is because Moses' prophecy is the source and the basis of the Torah. If not for Moses' prophecy, we wouldn't have the Torah. So Moses had to have this incredible, clear vision of everything. Most other prophets, and I'm not going to go into this at great length, but Maimonides explains that based on the earlier sources, that when a prophet would get his prophecy, he would go into a trance. He would fall asleep. And he would get a message, and then he would have to interpret the message. Moses didn't have to go through that process. He would he could be sitting down, standing up, doing whatever he would be doing, and God would say, Moses, I have something to tell you. And the Torah describes it as if one person talking to his friend. That was how Moses related to God, and God related to Moses. And any time he had a question, if any other prophet had a question, he had to really psych himself, he had to prepare, and who knows how long it could take before God would respond, if God would respond. No prophet had a guarantee that he had a direct line with God. When God wanted to communicate with Isaiah, Jeremiah, he did. When he didn't want to, there was no prophecy. But Moses was different. Anytime Moses had a question, he could just say, God, I have a question. We just had the Pesach Sheni, the second Passover holiday, where the people who couldn't bring the Paschal offering because they were in contact with the dead, they were 
ritually unclean, and they complained, why can't we be part of it? So Moses says, you stumped me. I'm going to ask God. And he asks God, and God says, they're right. They're going to be given a second opportunity. Or later on in the Torah, when the daughters of Tzalafchad, the first women to come forward and protest, not that they were protesting, that they wanted something for themselves, but they said our father's share in the land of Israel was lost because he died because of, of his sins. And why shouldn't we be able to inherit his share in the land of Israel? And Moses was stumped again. He didn't know what to tell them. So he said, wait, I'll ask God. And there are a few other examples like that. So Moses was unique in the way he transmitted God's message to the people because he had a direct line where everything was as clear as day. There was no haziness. There was no, he didn't have to go into a trance. He didn't have to interpret the dream. God spoke to him directly. At any rate, Moses was the first one to put into writing what we call the written Torah. But he wasn't the only one. After Moses died, you had his successor, Joshua, and you had other prophets. Yes? What aspect of God was it that spoke to Moses? Was it the Elohim? Was it... Elohim? No, it was, it was the highest level. It was the highest, it was all transcendental. Yeah, Moses was the highest level. So, you had other prophets to whom God spoke and who were told to put into writing what God said to them. So that, that also forms part of what we call Tanakh. So let's go through Tanakh in a crash course in 10 minutes, what all of the biblical books are about. We start off with the five books of Moses, which is called by the word Torah, or Chumash. You ever heard the term Chumash? Chumash is really related to the word Chamisha, five. Chamesh, five because there are five books. So each book is called a chumash. So when someone says, I, I, I'm learning chumash today, it means I'm learning one of the five books of Moses. Okay, so the first book is Breshit, or Genesis. What does Genesis talk about? It talks about creation, and how from creation God creates human beings, Adam and Eve, and how they fail the test. And then Noah and the flood, which we discussed last week, then the patriarchs who are God's chosen ones because of their commitment to God. And the whole book of Genesis is, <laughs> seems to be flowing in the direction of the creation of a Jewish family, the nucleus of what will become a Jewish nation. So that's the book of Genesis, creation to Jewish nation. The book of Exodus is from the formation of a Jewish people, a Jewish nation, going through their enslavement as a way of preparing them, of refining them, the Exodus, and then finally, the book of Exodus talks about the revelation of God at Mount Sinai when he gives the constitution for the Jewish people to the Jewish people. And then there's a little reversal. There's, I didn't put it in the text over here, but don't tell anybody I said this. The Jews worshipped a golden calf 40 days after they got the Torah, and it reversed everything, it seemed. That God is saying, one second, this is not the type of nation that I put my trust in, that they're going to carry on the message. But Moses interceded on their behalf, and God finally forgave them, gave them a second set of tablets, because Moses shattered the first set, and God says, I will now allow myself to dwell amongst you. Build me a sanctuary which they did, a portable sanctuary, which was the model and the forerunner of the ultimate sanctuary called the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple, which was built much later. Leviticus is about the service in the temple, in the Mishkan, in the sanctuary, the so-called uh, portable sanctuary. And the whole book of Le Leviticus is about how to become a holy people. The Jewish people were designated to be a holy people. What does that mean to be a holy people? It means to live your life in a moral way, in a more, more than just basic morality, but advanced morality. And that's what the whole book of Leviticus is about. It's about the special family within the Jewish people, the Kohanim, the priests, whose lives have to be on a higher spiritual level, but also many of the laws that relate to how Jews are holy. How do we become holy? So the book of Leviticus contains two 
very important pillars of Jewish holiness. One is the laws of kashrut, Jewish dietary laws. They're contained in the book of Leviticus. That makes us holy. It makes us different. We can't join others in their feasts because we keep a kosher diet. That makes us, sets us apart. And then we also have the laws against forbidden relationships that the Torah records in the book of Leviticus, which also is designed to make us holy and different in terms of our morality. So that's the book of Leviticus. Then we have the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers deals with the Jewish people traveling through the desert, which is a, a model of the future. All of Jewish history is, is really the book of Numbers. We're go traversing the desert, we have our ups and downs, and we are preparing to get to the promised land. That is essentially what all of Jewish history is about, the book of Numbers. And we had many downs and many ups, but finally we reach the, the borders of the promised land, of the land of Israel, which was originally called the land of Canaan. The book of Deuteronomy is different from the other four books. Here Moses is getting ready to leave this world. God says you can't enter the land. New generation has to take over. So Moses addresses the Jewish people for 37 days and until the day he passes away, which is the seventh day of the month of Adar. The very end of Deuteronomy is about Moses' passing. And what does Moses do in the book of Deuteronomy? He does two things. He, he uh, admonishes them for the things they did wrong and reminds them of their weaknesses, puts them in their place. And the second thing is he rehashes all of the commandments that were given before, just to get them prepared and ready to enter the promised land, knowing how to live their lives. So that's the, those are the five books of Moses. Then we get to the Nevi'im. Now everyone knows the five books of Moses by heart now. <laughs> then we get to Nevi'im, the N of Tanakh. The T of Tanakh is Torah. That's the five books of Moses. The N stands for Nevi'im. I'm not going to try to get involved with technology. <laughs> right on these boards. They should invent something called chalk. You know, that would be a wonderful invention. And a blackboard. And a blackboard <laughs> instead of this uh, fancy technology. At any rate, Nevi'im are prophets. After Moses is gone, Joshua, his trusted disciple, takes over, and he is the one who leads the Jewish people into the promised land and conquers much of the land, and divides it amongst the 12 tribes. Now, what we see over here historically is that even though you had the Jewish people, one people, entering into one land, it was like 12 different countries. Each tribe was independent of the others. There was no central authority. There was no real leader. Whenever they needed to have soldiers to fight against an enemy, they would sometimes join another tribe. And sometimes the tribes didn't get along. There was even a civil war. That's the book of Judges. So Joshua is the book of the conquest and division. Judges is the book of how the Jews lived independently and how they had to struggles with their enemies. Everyone heard of Samson, Samson and Delilah. Well, Samson was one of the judges who protected the Jews against the Philistines. Then we get to the book of Samuel, Shmuel which has it divided into two parts. But Shmuel is about the beginning of a unified nation, starting with the prophet Shmuel. He was the most dynamic spiritual leader from the time of Joshua onward. He was the dynamic leader of the Jewish people. He inspired them. He elevated their morals and their spirituality. And he, at the request of the people for a king, he anointed King Shaul, Saul, as the first king of the Jewish people. But King Shaul was not really up to the task of being a king. He was weak. He, was, he did not take the reins of power seriously. And therefore, he eventually was killed in a battle with the Philistines. But, but before that, Samuel told him, you're no longer going to be king. I'm going to anoint someone else. And King David is anointed. And the book of Samuel is about King David's tumultuous life. King David is going to be the progenitor of a dynasty of kings and leaders leading up to the Mashiach. 
But King David's life itself was fraught with so many difficulties. He was constantly fighting with his father-in-law, King Saul. That was actually his father-in-law who wanted to kill him because he was afraid that he would take away the, the uh, position of monarch. You hear, Shalom? <laughs> My great-grandchild. <No>. So uh, <laughs> did, what, did I say something wrong? <laughs> I don't know, he looks like pretty critical. Uh, so King Saul was afraid of King David. He wanted him dead. King David escaped. King David had problems with his own son, Absalom, Absalom, who tried to throw him out of power. He had many different problems in his life, but King David was recognized as the ultimate model of righteousness. In spite of the one indiscretion, of his life, which was really not as bad as it seems, but King David took it very seriously. King David was the model of a king who recognized when he was told that he did something wrong, he says, yes, I sinned. He didn't say, but there was a reason for it. You know, whenever we're caught doing something wrong, we, we, we might have to admit it, but then we say, but I, I have a reason. I was weak. I was, I was tired. King David didn't try to justify what he did. In fact, he he exaggerated the severity of what he did. Anyhow, King David passes away. His greatest dream was to build the Beit HaMikdash, the final permanent dwelling place of God. But God told him, no, you can't build it because your hands are filled with blood. You fought many battles, and even though those battles were justified, still God did not want the house of God to be anything but a house that represented total peace. And that happened in the days of King Solomon, which is what the book of Kings is all about. King Solomon's ascension to the throne, the building of the Holy Temple, and King Solomon's own life, which unfortunately did not live up to the highest ideals. And because of that, he was told that his son, who succeeded him, would no longer be the king of the entire Jewish people. So you, you had this, we went up all the way from being a fragmented tribal people to becoming a unified people through King David and King Solomon, and now King Solomon's son overtaxed the people, and the people rebelled, and ten tribes seceded from the Union. Yes, that was the first time we had a people, a groups of people, states seceding from the Union, and it never got back to, to together. Those ten tribes were eventually exiled, by the Assyrian Empire, and they were scattered all over the world, and we don't even know where they are today. We have a lot of theories, but that's all in the Book of Kings. And it leads ultimately to the time of the destruction of the first temple, because the people degenerated into idol worship, among other sins. And the, God says, I can't live amongst you anymore. The temple, will, I'll, I will allow the Babylonians to destroy the temple. And that's where the, king, the Book of Kings is more or less concludes. Then we have a few other biblical books. Isaiah, he very much earlier than the destruction, he predicted the destruction, but he also devotes most of the book to consolation, consoling the people. Yes, God is upset with you, but he will take you back. So the book of Isaiah is called the book of consolation. Ezekiel lived, the Jeremiah rather, he lived at the time of the destruction. He prophesied it. He was thrown into prison. They didn't want to hear the bad news. People don't like to hear bad news. Jeremiah was the conveyor of bad news, and they wanted him out. And Jeremiah, his prophecies eventually prevailed. The temple was destroyed. And then we have the prophet Ezekiel, who lived in the time of exile, and he was teaching the people how to cope with the exile, but also God was giving him the instructions to rebuild the temple. In other words, it's a book of hope that the temple will eventually be rebuilt. Then there are what is called minor prophets. They're not minor in stature, they're minor in the text. They're very short books, so they, they were consolidated into one text. And amongst them you have prophets who did the same as Isaiah, who were predicting the destruction and com comforting the people. Some of them were uh, rebuking the people and you have the book of Jonah for example who was told to speak to the people of Nineveh to, that they should repent 
and they did in the end. So you have all these different uh, types of prophets, each one in his own style, rebuking the people and comforting the people and leading the people. Then we have the third part of Tanakh, Ketuvim. If you write Tanakh with a K, Tanakh, because people can't say Cha. The, it stands for Ketuvim or Chetuvim. And they include books like Job. Job is a book about suffering. How do we deal with suffering? Psalms is really a collection of prayers. King David taught us how to pray. He taught us how to praise God, how to beseech God. Proverbs is King Solomon's teachings of wisdom, extolling the virtue of wisdom, which is something that Jewish people took very seriously. Daniel is about prophecies of the Messianic age. And by the way, all of the prophets, that theme of the Messianic age runs through every prophetic book. Maimonides, when he describes the, the Mashiach, he says the Mashiach is hinted in the Torah, it's alluded to in the Torah in a few places, in the five books of Moses, but the prophetic books are filled with, with references to Mashiach. The book of Ezra is the history of the Jewish people when they return to Israel under the direction and leadership of Ezra. Chronicles is the last biblical book. It's the survey of history from Adam. The first word of the book of Chronicles is Adam, and it goes all the way through the period to leading up to the second temple. So it's, it's, it's a, you consider it a historical book, but it isn't really only historical because the way it describes events is unique that it has to be interpreted to refer to different ideas as well. Then you have the story of Purim in the book of Esther, the story of Ruth, of a story of a righteous convert which people read on Shavuot, the upcoming holiday, because she was a convert to Judaism. You have the book of Lamentations which was written by Prophet Jeremiah. While the temple was burning, he, he composed the book of Lamentation which we have recited in the past on Tisha B'Av. I hope this year we won't have to recite it because Mashiach will be here and take us out of exile, rebuild the temple. Kohelet is again a book of King Solomon where he uh, emphasizes the futility of living an empty life, a life that void of spirituality. And then you have another book of King Solomon, the Song of Songs. It's a love song, a collection of love songs between two lovers but it's all a metaphor between God and the Jewish people, God showing his love for the Jewish people and our reciprocation of that love. The Talmud, Rabbi Akiva says, all of the Torah is holy. The Song of Songs is the holy of holies because it's the most intimate description of our relationship with God. It's pure love that it, it focuses on that we have for God and God has for us. Okay, so now we know the Tanakh. Now you could say you've covered the entire Tanakh. Uh, Tanakh represents, again, the written text. Now in the five books of Moses, you have a lot of different themes. You have history, story of creation, the story of Adam and Eve and Noah and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and his brothers and the, ex this, uh, the bondage and the exodus and the giving of the Torah. It's a historical document, you could think but it also has commandments. God commands us what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to live our lives. So everyone knows of the Ten Commandments. And this is one of the areas of Judaism which unfortunately most people have a misunderstanding of. There's no such thing as Ten Commandments. It's a misnomer, it's Ten Statements. The ten so-called Ten Commandments contain 14 commandments. If you, what is the definition of a commandment? Do this, don't do this. So if you count the number of times it says do this and don't do this, it adds up to 14. But if you go through the whole Torah, there are 613 commandments. So when people say Ten Commandments, and I say it also because that's the way of, in order to communicate with people, people won't know what I'm talking about. And if you say, do you know the Ten Statements? People will say, what are you talking about? Oh, Ten Commandments, yeah, there's a movie about it. <laughs> but the Ten Statements, they didn't make a movie about Ten Statements. So everyone 
knows about the Ten Commandments, but they don't realize these were ten statements that formed the nucleus of all of the 613 commandments. In fact, if you count the letters of the so-called Ten Commandments, there are 620 letters. And commentators point out there are 613 biblical commandments that were given to the Jewish people, but there were also seven commandments given to all of humanity and were given to Adam and then to Noah and then reiterated at Mount Sinai in the God's communication to the Jewish people. So if you take 613 plus 7, you have 620, which is the number of letters in the Ten Commandments, in the so-called Ten Commandments. And the number 620 is an important number in Judaism because the Hebrew word for crown is keter or keser, which adds up to 620. The commandments are God's crown. The crown, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit of short Hasidic explanation. What is the highest part of the person? It's the brain, the mind. But there's something above the mind, your willpower. If I want to study something, and I find it challenging, but I really want to study it, I will get to it. It'll, it'll happen. If I want to go someplace that has a lot of challenges, my will will get me to do whatever my will wants me to do. Willpower is the most powerful force. So above the mind is the power of will. How do you symbolize that? By a crown. The crown is above the head, symbolizing that there's a power that is beyond our understanding. Yes, Shalom. Sorry about that. No, no. That's all right. He doesn't disturb. <laughs> when he starts asking difficult questions, that's a different story. <laughs> so the symbol of will is the crown. What is a commandment? Commandment is God's will. What he wants us to do. There's the wisdom of God, but there's also his will. So that's why the 620 commandments, 613 plus 7, repre is represented by the word keter, crown, because it represents God's will, which is beyond even his wisdom. Okay, so we have 613 commandments, and these 613 are further divided into two categories. Some, sometimes we call them positive and negative, prescriptive, proscriptive the do's and the don'ts. There are 248 commandments that tell us what to do. Circumcise your son. Give tzedakah. Eat matzah on Passover. Listen to the shofar, and so on and so forth. There are a total of 248 of those, and there are 365 don'ts. Don't steal, don't commit murder, don't uh, lie and so on and so forth. So 248 verses 365. But also all the 613 could be divided into two other categories. The commandments between us and God, the so-called man to God commandments, human to God commandments, and then there's benadam lechaveiro, the commandments that govern our relationship with others. So the commandments can be divided several different ways, positive, negative, between us and God, and between us and our fellow human being. Now we get to the oral Torah. And this is the most important thing about Torah, that in order for us to understand how Judaism came to where it is today, you have to have the oral Torah. The oral Torah has several functions. Oral Torah is a translation and it's a commentary. And it also has the translation and commentary on the written Torah. When God gave Moses the written Torah, he told him what to put into writing. If you ever see an open the Torah scroll, how many here have seen an open Torah scroll? Okay, almost everyone has seen an open Torah scroll. If you look there, there are letters, if you know Hebrew letters, you will see there are no vowels, only consonants. Try reading a newspaper, taking out all the vowels from the text. Just consonants, no A, E, I, O, or U. You're gonna have a hard time 
and you're going to probably make a lot of misrepresentations of what the text really says. So the Torah was given with consonants in the text. There are no vowels, zero vowels. If that isn't confusing enough, there are no periods, no commas, no quotation marks, no punctuation whatsoever. So how do you, how do you read it? The answer is, you can't. You'll be very confused because the vowels and the punctuation was transmitted orally. Now when we have published editions of the Torah, of the five books of Moses, we print them with vowels. But those vowels were originally passed down orally. There's a story in the Talmud, everyone knows the story of the convert or the one who wanted to be a convert comes to Shammai and he says, teach me the whole Torah standing on one foot and he chases him out and he goes to Hillel and Hillel says, okay, I'll teach you. And he shows him the letter Aleph, the first letter of the alphabet. This is an Aleph, okay, no, no, no problem. This is a Bet, this is a Gimel. He went through the whole Aleph phase, the whole alphabet. And the would-be convert was very pleased that he had mastered the Hebrew alphabet. The next day, Hillel goes and shows him the Aleph, and he tells him that's a bet. And the bet is an Aleph. He confuses him. He says, well, yesterday you told me this. Oh, I, I left out a very important part. When he came to Shammai, the reason why Shammai threw him out was because he says he only wants to learn the written Torah. He doesn't want to read the oral Torah. He doesn't believe in the oral Torah, just the written. So Hillel says, you trusted me because yesterday I said an Aleph is an Aleph. How do you know an Aleph is an Aleph? Because you trusted me. Well, you should trust me that I'm giving you the truth of what the Torah means. Because if you don't know how to translate the Torah, then you can't really use it. It's, it's useless. I'll give you an example. In the beginning of Genesis, it says, Vayihi Erev, there was evening, Vayihi Boker, and there was morning, Yom Echad, one day. Now the Hebrew word for evening, Erev, if I change the punctuation, the vowels, it could read Arov. Arov means a mixture. And there was a mixture. And the word Boker, morning, could be read Bakar, cattle. There was a mixture of cattle, one day. Does that make sense? No, but that's how you could read it. There's no vowels. You could read it any way you like. Or it says in the Torah, you shouldn't eat meat with milk. What's the Hebrew word for milk? Does anyone know? Chalav. But if you have no vowels, it could be chalev. Chalev is fat. Don't eat meat with fat. Not good for your heart. That, that's how you would read it. How do we know it means milk? The answer is that's how it was transmitted orally. So the oral Torah, first and foremost, is a translation without which you can't really know what the Torah is about. Because every, if, do that, try to do that, do this exercise at home. Take any English text, take a few sentences and take out the vowels and you can be very creative. You can create new meanings, new ideas, because without the vowels you can add your own vowels. You can do whatever you want. <coughs> yes? Rabbi, the, the implication to me of what you're saying then is that God knew that that would happen. So God meant for humanity to have control after of what the Torah means. We have control because God gave us the oral Torah and we have, we, that was preserved and therefore we know what God had in mind. But it's, it's, it's true that we are the ones who transmit the Torah but we transmit the Torah that was given to us by God. But oral Torah is more than just a translation. It's also a commentary. It clarifies what exactly does the Torah really mean, both in the area of the narratives, the stories of the Torah, and the area of laws. I'll give you two examples, or three examples. We know that Cain was the first child ever born. Abel was his brother. They didn't really get along, but that's a separate story. And Cain, the Torah says, had a child. His, 
name was Hanoch. Who did he marry? What we have is Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. Abel is now dead. And Cain fathers a child. With whom? It was only, the only female around was his mother. So is that to suggest that he committed incest with his mother? And the answer is no. The oral tradition says that when he was born, and likewise when his brother Abel was born, they were born with twin sisters. And yes, they did commit incest. That was the only way that humanity could continue because God did not create multiple humans. He created only one human being, Adam, and he separated Eve from Adam, and then they fathered and mothered two children, and then the third one later on, and other children later on, and they marry their twin sisters, the sons. Now, if you don't have the oral Torah, try this on some, uh, someone who doesn't know about the oral Torah and ask them, who did Cain marry? They're not gonna have an answer because they don't have the oral Torah. That's just one very obvious example. The oral Torah told us that, yes, they had twin sisters. Then we have the story, a very cryptic story of Lemech. Lemech is a descendant of Cain, and he has two wives, and he's having a problem with his two wives, and he's begging to them to listen to him and to, did I, did I kill someone? What, What's going on over there? It doesn't tell you any, doesn't give you any commentary what it's about. So the oral tradition says there was a whole story over here. Cain's descendant, Lemech, was going hunting. He was blind. He went hunting with his son, Tuval Cain. And what happened? There was some movement in the brush that was Cain, his ancestor, and they thought it was an animal. Didn't we have a, a vice president that had that problem? <laughs> and he shot, he shot what he thought was the animal, and he killed Cain. And when his wife saw that he had committed murder, although it was un unintentional, they didn't want to have anything to do with him. So he's pleading with them. He says, you know, I, I, it was an accident. So if you read the biblical text, you won't get all that unless you know the oral tradition. Yes? The oral tradition. So how did that evolve? We know, I mean, the Torah was very specific. It was given to us by Moses and it was transcribed. Now, now you talk about an oral Torah. So the answer, simple answer, is that, that Moses taught it to the people. The people taught it to their children. The, 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 the ones, the rabbis who were the more learned ones made sure to transmit it to the next generation. We'll go into the oral law more. I'm, I'm, I'm just setting the stage now for it. Yes? Rabbi, what does a... Chabad rabbi, or serious rabbi. Oh, that, you mean Chabad uh, who, rabbis are not serious. <laughs> who, who is also a geneticist. Say in regard to Adam and Eve, because their genes would be the same, mm -hmm. and it would be one only one gene pool, and then if Cain, and it would only be a one gene pool, and it would all be the same. There would be no difference. Mm -hmm. How do they explain how would they explain the whole, everything? Okay, when I meet a serious rabbi who's a geneticist, I'll ask him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a geneticist, and I try to be serious, but I'm, but I'm not joking. <laughs> but that's a good, good question. I'll have to do some research on it. Okay, so that's another story. There's a story about how Miriam said something about Moses, and God rebukes her and says, Moses is, I speak to me, I speak to him face to face, and he's a humble man. What's going on over there? The Torah doesn't give you the, the details. Why, was, why did she slander Moses? So the oral Torah tells us there's a whole story attached to that. It's a long story, I don't know if we'll have time, but the story goes like this. Moses said he can't handle the people when they demanded meat. So God says, there will be prophets. You will delegate your light to them, your power to them, and they'll take care of it with their spiritual energy. 
And then two people who were not designated all of a sudden started saying prophecy. And Joshua was very upset at them because they were saying prophecy that Moses is going to die and that Joshua is going to take them into Israel. He couldn't tolerate that. Anyhow, that's not related to this part of the story. Then when Moses' wife, Zipporah, heard that the report that there were two prophets out there, she says, woe to their wives. So Miriam said, what, what's, what, what's wrong? He says, Moses and I have separated because God told Moses, you're on call, you can't have a relationship with your wife. After Mount Sinai, God tells the people, go back to your homes, but you, Moses, you stay with me. That's it, no more family life. So Moses separated from his wife. So she thought that anyone who's a prophet can't engage in marital relations, can't be married. So she said, woe to their wives. So Miriam got very upset. She said, I'm also a prophet, but I live a normal family life. And so is my brother Aaron. And she murmured about that. And God says, you're not like Moses. Moses is different. He's always on call 24-7. But that's the details that you don't get in the text. The text is very, very ambiguous. But then, yes? Parts of the Torah together, but obviously he made a choice to not give it together. They were given together. But, but at Sinai, when God, when Moses was on the mountain, God told Moses, "Okay, I'm take dictation." So he dict, right, Bereshit in the beginning, Bara Elokim, God created. He took down the dictation word for word. Then God says, "Now I'll explain to you what it means, what the what what the definition of these things are, the translation, the, the definition, the meaning of it, the details." But you don't write that down. You transmit that orally. But, but why? Like why? Why not just give okay, it? Okay, that we're, we're, we're going to cover that. Problem. That's that's a, an integral part of the of the class. Maybe not today, but next week. I hope for sure. God willing. <laughs> then there are laws. Don't work on the Sabbath. The Torah doesn't tell us what work is. If I ask ten Jews what how they define work, I'm likely to get ten different answers. And they w wouldn't be wrong. They'd all be right. For someone, work means do what you're doing for a living. You don't enjoy what you're doing. You call that work. It's, it's, it's not enjoyable. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but let's say babysitting for your great-grandchild. That's work, but it's not, not work. it's not really work. <laughs> no, it's not work. Work is defined differently. Some people will say, Raising up, lifting up a heavy load is work. Uh, doing other things is not work. I mean, everyone has their own definition. So how does the Torah expect us to follow that commandment when it doesn't tell us what work means? And the answer is it did tell us what work means in the oral tradition. It defined work as any of the types of labor that were instrumental in the creation of the mishkan, of the temporary portable sanctuary and if you and it's hinted in the Torah in the written Torah because when the Torah tells us to build the sanctuary it says don't build it on don't do work on the Sabbath as if to say that that's the definition of work so so uh, writing is considered work even if you write two letters picking a heavy load weighing 300 pounds is not advisable to do on Shabbat because it takes away from the spirit of Shabbat, but it's not considered work based on the definition of the oral Torah. Another example, everyone knows, even the people who don't follow the Torah or don't believe in its divinity, they all know that there's a holiday called Rosh Hashanah. Where is Rosh Hashanah mentioned in the Torah? Never! In the entire five books of Moses, the word Rosh Hashanah does not appear. But what does appear? The Torah says on the first day of the seventh month is a day of blowing. What does it mean? Rosh Hashanah is supposed to be the new year, and yet it calls it the seventh month and the day of blowing. Blowing what? Does it say to blow the shofar? No. Nowhere does the Torah say that on Rosh Hashanah you're supposed to blow the shofar. Nowhere in the five books of Moses, that is. So then what is it all about? So the oral Torah says very simple. The way to count the months 
There are two systems. One system is we count from Nisan, the month in which we have Passover. So Rosh Hashanah is the seventh month. Blowing refers to the shofar, the ram's horn. This is all based on the oral tradition. And there are hints in the Torah. Yes, there are hints in the Torah that you would never have guessed that that's what the Torah means. Once you know what the oral tradition says, you could then find these things hinted in the Torah. Another commandment, it says on the holiday of Sukkot, Sukkot, you're supposed to take pre a fruit, eighths of a tree, hadar, beautiful, a fruit of a beautiful tree, or a, a beautiful fruit of a tree. Which fruit could that be? What do you think is a beautiful fruit? A beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. But so do you ever see people taking a, uh, an apple on the holiday of Sukkot with an apple with a palm branch? I never saw that. Ever see anyone taking a pear, a peach, a grapefruit? No. We take a le etrog. A etrog is a citrus fruit that grows in the Mediterranean area, in Israel and Italy, and can grow in, in California and Florida. And it's a very delicate fruit. And to me, it's not the most beautiful fruit. I don't even know what a beautiful fruit means, if you ask me. Fruits are fruits. But the Torah says it's a beautiful fruit. And we always knew that it had to be that etrog, which was not the most common fruit in those days. It's not as if it was ubiquitous and everyone saw trees that had that. It was just a fruit that the Torah chose. But we don't know that unless we read the oral Torah, which I should say was eventually put into writing. So now the oral Torah, we have it in writing now, and that's what the Talmud contains, the oral teachings that were preserved orally. Another very important example, everyone knows, and this is what sometimes Christians attack us, that we are the, the, the so-called Old Testament depicts God as a God of vengeance. God is not a loving God, which is of course nonsense, but one of the <coughs> proofs of it is the eye for an eye that if someone takes out your eye, they take out your eye. That's pretty harsh. That was never the way it was understood in the oral tradition. The oral tradition always interpreted it to mean you pay the value of the eye for the eye. It's like an insurance company, if someone loses an eye in an accident and they have to compensate you for it, they'll determine how much the eye was worth in terms of employment, how much you, you're going to lose, the actuaries will figure that out. Well, that's the way the Torah meant, that you pay for the damage, the loss of the eye or the tooth or the, whatever the limb may be. Tefillin, something that Jews have been wearing for thousands of years, and when they find, the archaeologists find tefillin that are 2,000 plus years old, they are identical to the tefillin we have today. <coughs> Yigal Yadin was a famous archaeologist and a uh, minister in the Israeli government, and he found the oldest pair of tefillin, I don't remember exactly the age, and they were just like the tefillin we have today. In fact, the Talmud says that they once tried to change the shape of the tefillin to make it round, and that's not kosher. I was once giving a talk on this very subject, and a rabbi who was also an archaeologist says, oh no, you're not right, you say that the tefillin were always square. Uh, I have a pair of tefillin, very old, probably of 1,500 or more years old, that was round. So, the, I, you know, I said, well, the exception proves the rule. But then I looked it up. The Mishnah actually says that there were people who tried to make round tefillin. Why? Because the Romans banned wearing tefillin. So they thought if they make it round, they'll get around the ban of the Romans. And the Mishnah says, no, it doesn't work. It's dangerous to wear round tefillin. So we always knew there were always people who tried to change the tefillin and that was rejected. We always had the identical tefillin. But the Torah, does, all it says about tefillin is, you shall tie it for a sign on your hand, and they shall be as an ornament between your eyes. It doesn't explain which part of the hand, the arm. The oral tradition gives us all the, <coughs> defini all the, 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 the details of what tefillin are. Mezuzah, we all know what a mezuzah is. Mezuzah is not the case, it's the parchment in the case. I know someone who, who uh, once came to me and says, I have the scroll, now I need the mezuzah. Oh, you got it wrong. You have 
the mezuzah, and now you need a case for it. But the mezuzah is the scroll that's inside. All the Torah says, you shall write them on the doorposts of your homes and gates. That's it. And yet mezuzah has so many laws about how it's written, how it's affixed, and that's all part of the oral tradition. Yes? Rabbi, so why did different, different Hasidic sects put on the tefillin differently? The way we put it on is custom. There are basic requirements that are based on the oral tradition, but then there are different customs about the, the oral tradition doesn't say how to wrap the straps. That was based on custom, and some of it are based on mystical ideas. So that's, that's again, it's based on custom, not on the requirements of the oral law. Then the oral tradition also has independent laws that are not based on anything in the Torah. For example, the shape and the color of the tefillin are not hinted in the Torah at all. They were transmitted orally. On the holiday of Sukkot, there was a, a requirement to pour water on the altar. Throughout the year, they would pour wine. On the Sukkot, they would pour wine and water. Nowhere does the Torah say that. This was passed down orally from one generation to another. We're going to have to leave the rest of this class for next week. And if anyone has any questions. So we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how the oral law applies to new developments. For example, there's a very raging dispute amongst rabbis. You have a surrogate mother. The egg is from one woman. The, mother, the, the one who carried the baby is another woman. Who is the mother, legally, by Jewish law? The, the egg donor or the one who carried the, the, the child and gave birth to the child? You could argue either way, but we have to know where does Jewish law talk about this? How are we going to get an answer to that? That's an application of the oral law to new developments. Then we have disputes. Why do we have arguments? If God handed down the teachings, we do what God says. And the answer to that, briefly, is that there are certain things about which there are no arguments, because they were passed down faithfully. But then there are new developments about which there are different approaches. And then we have rabbinic laws. And those rabbinic laws were also part of the oral tradition. They were passed down orally until they were finally put into writing. And then we'll discuss why was there a need for an oral law? Why couldn't it have all been put into writing? And could we change those laws? Those are the things that we're going to discuss in the next few classes. Okay, everyone.